Hi, and welcome back to the Always Right Podcast. I'm author Carissa DeLay, and... I'm Jamie Vendera. And we have a special guest today, and I'm going to let Jamie take over and introduce our guest. I am excited today because uh, I love this guy. This is Mr. Jeff Rivera. And Jeff, I don't even know how long ago we met. It was like 2008 or 2009. I don't even... you. We discussed this. You don't even know how you found me, but you had interviewed me for Huffington Post's. Talking about Mythbusters and some other stuff, but I really can't even remember how we hooked up. Can I put twenty dollars on the line to say how y'all met? Yeah, go ahead. Could have been uh, your sister. Met in, no, you met in the water bottle aisle, getting jugs uh, of water. Oh, you mean this? This? Yes. Right here. Jeff Rivers. Yeah, I know you got one. Yeah, yeah, mine's right here. I got my water bottle right here. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Cheers. So, um, yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember. I think I'm sure it was initially via email. Uh, I don't know how I got your email, and we talked and we clicked right away and then we became like brothers like almost immediately and we one of the things i loved about um jamie that really made him stand out uh was not only because he, he's you know multi-talented but because he is a giver um and it's so it's so rare to find like a person who gives as much as they take and he mm -hmm. actually gives more than he takes and that really stood out from like oh wow there's somebody who really cares so you say uh, that but man you have been well, you have mentored me a lot we've spent hours upon hours. if i had to pay you as a consultant i would be have paid you thousands and thousands of dollars because you've helped me out a lot along the ways so thank you well you too you've done a lot for me um you've done things for me that that nobody has and and then for me just as a friend you know the things i've gone through all the all the drama and things yeah. relationships and whatever else and pets and all kinds of stuff like that you know so i'm close to your I'm, sister too so Sass yeah, has been yeah, my you, student you, and we're good friends that's right you're close to my v. you know close to my sister and and um love that and so yeah i mean um we've been we've been there for each other through thick and thin and um and you've and one of you're one of the fun people i could just joke around and say all those those kind of jokes the jokes yep. that you should ever say on the air like you know <laughs> And you think nothing of it. In fact, you jump right in. Yep. <laughs> I've had to edit some of those jokes out. <laughs> I'm like, well, I probably shouldn't put that on the podcast. Let's just take that out of there. I was like, ramp went right over my head. I, d I don't understand the words coming out of my mouth. Right, Jeff, exactly. <laughs> I, I kind of want you to give everyone an overview of who you are. Please yeah. don't list your whole resume. We do not oh, have gosh, three we'll hours. For like two hours, yeah. We, I mean, <laughs> what, he, what he sent us, he's like, that's just a smidgen of it. But the one thing I want to say that you repeat is I've thought I've written a lot of books. I've ghost written, uh, you know, co-written, personally written over 60 books, probably closer to 100 if I'm like producing. And I'm mm -hmm. like, you're double that easy. You've written like over 200 books, which blows my mind. But there's so much more to you. So can you give us a rundown on some of the stuff that you do? The highlights yeah, of that. Yeah, I was born in a poor Paul Tan and Salt Lake. No, but um, I actually was born in Salt Lake City, of all places. People like Salt Lake City. Um, and then I grew up in Oregon. And from the time I was about six or seven years old, I uh, was a writer. And I didn't know it was called writing. I would love to do it. I would write little stories about uh, kids in class. And they would say, like, you know, you better watch out. Or Jeff's going to write a story about you. And so I just, I just loved to write stories. And I would read stories to my sister. And she would encourage me and tell me that was really good. And and, um, you know, I was very fortunate that the teachers recognized my talent and put me in the talented and gifted program for writing at a very early age. So I knew I had some talent and my, my goal, my dream was to be an author, like a published author. And I was able to, long story short, accomplish that. Years later, I, I started out um, really self-publishing. I'd never really written a, a novel before at all. Um, and so I thought, well, I really want to make this this novel I had this screenplay that I've been toying with for a long time. And I thought, well, this would make a great novel. A friend of mine told me that. And um, I thought, okay, well, I'll do that. Um, and um, and I didn't know what I was doing. But I knew how to tell a story. And I went online. I found some uh, message boards. Remember message boards back in the day? I do. Uh, <laughs> not those kind, Jamie. No, um, I had one for voice connection for like 10 years. Okay. So, yeah, not well, the right ones. <laughs> I was in a G-rated uh, message board and I connected with the people and I would show them just excerpts like, hey, do you think is this any good? And they just loved it. And they started downloading the story as I as I wrote it. And they were 
you know, spreading all over the place. And I thought it was amazing. So by the time that um, I finished writing it, and there were, I think, tens of thousands of downloads, if I remember correctly. And long story short, serendipity. I mean, I ended up uh, joining this newsletter, which had a post about Warner Books and that this editor was looking for uh, books that were uh, with Latino characters. And I thought, well, mine is. So I sent mine in. I called her. She kind of said, oh, yeah, 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 sure to send it in. Um, and then another long story short, I didn't really hear from her for months. So I, um, I got an agent, a book agent. And the way I got my agent was I spam blasted all of publishing. Didn't even say, didn't even say dear sir or to whom it, all it was was the text of the book. Just the first, the first chapter. That's it. In a little cover, nothing else. And I had like, I think half a dozen people from publishing, book publishers, editors respond back to me wanting to read this book. Um, I think I had two or three agents. But one in particular really gravitated towards the story. She loved it. And I ended up um, signing with that uh, that agent. I told her I had submitted it to Warner Books. And she goes, oh, I know the editor. And so she called her, let her know that she was representing um, the, the editor who hadn't read it, read it over the weekend and had an offer for me on Monday. So, <laughs> so I mean, right away. And so they acquired the rights to this, this self-published book. Um, and that was the beginning of, of my career. I had no idea it was going to change the rest of my life. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty, pretty cool. From there, I started to do more writing. I started interviewing people in publishing, which led me to uh, writing for Huffington Post. And um, that's how I met, you know, Jamie. <clears throat> and I learned I was really good at putting people together. And so I discovered I was a producer all along. And... Um, <laughs> I went out of the country, came back into the country, and I put together this virtual event with just senior level executives from home television and audio. And one of the uh, one of the people who came along was uh, Judith Kerr. She's the president publisher of Harper One Publishing, which of course is one of the biggest publishers in the world. And I saw all these business deals being done on this virtual event I put together. And I said, I know there's gotta be money in this. I just don't know how to make it. She said, well, you should meet, um, this uh, this colleague of mine named Lavelle Levette. And uh, you guys, I think you guys will hit it off. And she was right. We did hit it off. We decided to form this collective. Uh, and this collective, I put together a couple other people in it. And we started to represent some talent. We started to uh, work on some products together. We continue to do so. And um, the rest is history. I mean, so many great things have come from it. I ended up um, producing um, quite a few projects. I started to represent talent and I got 22 development deals in about, about a two year period for unscripted television, which is like reality TV documentaries uh, with big companies. I was able to get any major TV network executive on the phone, get a meeting with them. Um, so many great things came out of it. Even before I formed the collective, I had uh, a Disney executive reach out to me on the, out of the blue on Facebook. Um, I had a Netflix executive reach out to me on LinkedIn out of the blue. Uh, so things started to really kind of fall into place. And um, yeah, I started to, uh, I produced, uh, co-executive produced the American Reality Television Awards, which uh, was hosted by Vivica cool. Fox. Yeah. It had, That's you know, cool. Simon Cowell, uh, Courtney Cox, um, Reba McIntyre, so many people. Uh, were on the show. <clears throat> so many great things happened in the last, really last few years. Uh, but my heart is in writing. My heart is in creating. My heart is in telling stories. And I'll grab an iPhone and make a film. I don't really care. I'll, I'll animate something on a desktop. I'll, I'll write and put it up on Kindle. I just want to create. And so, so much has happened in the last you know year um, that I'd love to talk to you about. Oh yeah. So real quickly, and I'm not, I'm not, this time it's really funny because normally I make the show notes up and, you know, Jamie reads them and reads them typically the morning of. And mm -hmm. so I, we must have, we must have flipped roles this morning because Jamie wrote the, the show notes for this one. Yeah, and I, I was super busy this morning and I was reading them like as I'm getting up and making my coffee and getting ready. So it was, it's a little flipping of roles this morning. So if this question wasn't on the list that Jamie had asked, I would like to know what was your first book about? 
or what, what was genre what or what was okay, the sure. style well like you know when i was a kid when i was writing books or like my first professional book your first professional book okay because <laughs> when i was a kid i don't even remember what it was about yeah. um oh, I, remember, I remember my first book from third grade you, you do remember it yeah i was in the uh like they had the like the tag program but back then it was called dtp yeah yeah, yeah. And so I, one of the things that they have you do is write books whenever you are first doing this. So in third grade, I wrote a book and then in fourth grade, I wrote, wrote a book. I, I totally forgot about those. I wish I knew where they were. Um, but the first one was Miss Dawson's Missing. And it was my teacher. And I did a whole thing where she was missing and everybody had to find her. So, oh, I love that. Yeah. So yeah. Really but cool. what was your what was your first book that you published? What's well, funny because I was actually in the same program in third grade that the, the tag. Oh. Program. Yeah. Um, that first book, I think was like a book about a kids, a bunch of kids on an Island. I don't even remember what it was. Uh, but my first professional book is, is, is called forever my lady. And it is a love story about a kid who ends up in prison boot camp, and he's trying to change his life around to win back the love of his life. Um, and it's a really cool story it was, uh, uh, very well received. Um, and it really started my my career and changed everything, everything, everything about my life. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it's a cool story. Well, he, you, cool. you flip multiple genres though. Um, and that's mm -hmm. what I, I love about you because I remember when Daniel Mendelton and I started writing, he's like, we need a bunch of pen names because you can't write horror. You can't write romance. You can't write sci-fi. And at, at the time that was less than 20 years ago, there was still that stigma about, you know, branching out. But, you know, when I took over uh, and Krista came along, I was like, screw it. I'm not going to have pen names. I'm going to, you know, I wrote all these genres. So I know that you use some pen names, but a lot of times you use your own name. Um, mm -hmm. So it kind of brings us to the topic of today because uh, you had mentioned want to talk about speed writing to give something back to our listeners. And I can't think of how many people I've ran into is like, I've been writing a book. It's been on my shelf, uh, on old typewriter for 13 years or 47 <laughs> years, or I started uh -huh. on my iPad, but that was seven years ago and I just <laughs> can't find the time to write. And <laughs> then they never become an author. So yeah, everyone has a book in them. Everyone can release it. So I'm hoping yeah, we have a, we have an episode titled, I'm not a writer yet. Yes, uh -huh. exactly. So. I'm hoping you can share some of your wisdom considering you've written over 200 books on how yeah. we can speed up the process and help these authors yeah. get to the finish line. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think the first, the first uh, challenge people face is, you know, more of a mental challenge of whether or not they can do it. Um, they might say that they have writer's block or they've got so many ideas. They don't know which one to choose because they don't want to waste time. I don't believe in writer's block. It doesn't exist. I'm just I'm, that laughing. I'm literally yes. laughing. You're either bored or you're inspired. We had an episode we, where Jamie and I debated writer's block. And so I believe in writer's block as a, yeah, definitely a, a mental wall that you have mm -hmm. to get around where Jamie's like, you don't have writer's block. You're just bored. I'm like, I'm, I'm never bored. That's my attitude. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people, I think, I think the first thing people have to kind of get past is, is, uh, is there a story you're really dying to tell? And, and why, why do you want to write it? Is it for the money? Is it because you want to tell a story? And and there's nothing wrong with writing only for the money. Just be honest with yourself about why you want to do it. Read, uh, read. So that's the first step. And there's nothing wrong with writing it just for money, you know. But if there's a story you really want to tell, then it doesn't matter if you sell one copy or you sell 100 million because you you're gonna you're gonna tell it either way. If you're mm -hmm. if you're writing it only for the money or or mostly yeah. for the money, it's a different approach because you're gonna write more uh, of what the audience probably wants to read. Mm -hmm. So that's the first, the first step is why you're writing it. <clears throat> um, once you decide what that is and you're honest with yourself, then it's about just get something, anything on paper. Um, some people will talk about, you know, it, sort of diarrhea on paper or puking it out. Brain or, dumping. You know, per, yeah, yeah. Word dumping, you know, purging. Um, and that way it just, it, 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 it doesn't have to be perfect. It can be filled with typos. No one's ever going to really take a look at it until you become very famous and they want to see how it became what it became. But you have to kind of sort of get over yourself. And that's the first step. So I wouldn't worry about even story structure, um, any of the different paradigms that you could just, just get hero's journey. I wouldn't worry about any of that stuff in the first draft. Just get something on paper. Uh, 
and then it's kind of out of use. So from there, you can start building like a really great story. Now, there's two different types of writers. They say there's, you know, um, there's the pantsers and then there's the outliners. Um, and there's people who kind of do a hybrid of both. Um, and, and, and for those who may be very much beginners, pantsers, someone who just comes with the story along the way, they don't really plan it. They just kind of see what happens. And then an outliner um, is someone who plans ahead and decides what's going to happen from beginning mm -hmm. to end. And then they just kind of you know, craft it in that way. You could be both. You could be both. But um, <laughs> the point is just get something on paper. Um, I'm, an so I'm an outliner. And Jamie oh, is a... <laughs> yeah, I'm a pantser for <laughs> sure. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. I'm like, I don't want to know the ending. I want to, I want it to unfold as I'm writing. Yeah. There's a, there's a beauty in that. There's a beauty in that. And I've done both. Uh, I've got to do a little bit of, a little bit of both. Uh, I'm, just, I'm moving from the screen for just a second. I'm still sure. here. I'm still listening. I just have to, I'll, I'll be right back, but I'm listening. Okay. Go on. okay, okay. <laughs> I guess sure. I outline if I'm doing nonfiction books because then I'm meticulous and kind of anal about it. And I look at it like I'm doing a, a workshop so i got to know the beginning middle and ending yeah yeah the most important thing is just to get it out on paper and that's the the first step so uh i, I wanted to talk about like how to do speed writing and, and and we talked about first you need to decide you know uh, why you're doing it and then secondly you need to just get something on paper no matter what so this this speaks to uh i would say more outliners more than anything what i'm about to say um Chucky Darn. Darns for Jamie. I'll be right back in a half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would say what, what really has helped me uh, is to remove any obstacles. So it could be because you just want to get something on paper. One of the best ways to do it is to dictate it. Hmm. And you, me you can use, yeah, you can Years use ago. your, your, you can use one of those pricey, you know, software is like, uh, there's a dragon speech. You can use um, your your phone, which has a free one. You can use Google Docs as a free one. Um, it doesn't matter because as I've said to Jamie many times, and he agrees that the audience doesn't care how the sausage is made. They just care that it's juicy. Yeah. I don't know. Every time I've seen sausage made, it makes me not want to eat sausage. <laughs> you must not be having the right kind of sausage, Carissa. Uh, well, I, my family's Polish, so I like a good kapasa. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so, so, so you just uh, so that's that's one thing you can do to kind of speed uh, things up is just to dictate because then your hands not going to get tired, you're mm -hmm. not going to get all cramped up. You can walk around, you can go outside and take a walk, do your exercise while you're writing. You can do other things just to kind of get it out. And so that's one tip I have for you, anybody who wants to just speed write, is you don't worry about even punctuation. You definitely don't worry about typos. Uh, mm -hmm. because there's ways to clean it up and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so you just want to get that out on paper. Uh, another thing that you can do um, when you are outlining is model it after a story that's really successful or a movie. Look at the way that they structured their story, um, at least act by act. Like how did they set it up? How do they introduce the character? If it's a certain genre, there's certain tropes that are expected, whether it be romance or it be mystery, you must give the audience what they expect in that way. Mm -hmm. Otherwise they're going to be very upset with you. And, you know, people say they want original content and want something fresh and snappy. They don't, they want the same thing. They want more of the same. So how can you give them more of the same and at the same time, your take on it. So, you know, that's why they say read a lot, look at the way that people do things, watch a lot of movies and TV shows, you mm -hmm. know, look how they, all these experts did it. And what can you do um, to be inspired by that? Yep, you know, when I was writing the Phoenix Earth, uh, the space opera, that's exactly what I did. I was watching Stargate, uh, <laughs> uh, S I forget what the one where they were in outer space, uh, Battlestar Galactica, the TV series, anything that was in that area. Uh, I was just studying and seeing how characters interacted with each other, how, you know, exactly what you said, how the scenes built. So, yes, I, I dive into Netflix when I'm writing a series like that. <clears throat> Yeah, getting in the mood of that, and, and and I would say the different genres. Like so, um, you know, so so let's say you're a, let's say you're sci-fi, uh, you know, writer, sci-fi writer. 
I would say exactly what you said, Jamie. Go watch sci-fi films and TV shows for inspiration. Go watch foreign films, see how they do things. But uh, look at the way people, there's certain tropes and certain expectations that people of that genre want, and you must give it to them. Otherwise, they may know how to articulate it, but they're going to say that it, the book sucks. And mm -hmm. the reason why it sucks is probably because you're not giving them what they expect. Now, you're not following the the canon of that, that <laughs> yeah. genre that it's kind of like when someone reads a storyline that they love, they want to go find something very similar, maybe not yes. an exact storyline, but they're looking, it's like, just like searching Netflix, like, oh, because yeah. you watch this, you may like these other ones. These are thrillers, yes. these are sci-fi. If you see a movie or a show and it's listed under thrillers and it's not suspensefully thrilling, you're like, mm -hmm. okay, this isn't in the wrong category. Yeah. Yeah. You go in expecting one thing and you're getting something else in a bad way, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, you can, you can still make it fresh and different a little slightly and add a little layer or something, but you must, there's certain tropes. And so that's what I would suggest also is, you know, you know, immerse yourself in that material, but research what tropes do people expect? Go read the one star reviews on, mm -hmm. on Amazon of those books. Ones are the trolls. Ones are the trolls, ones five are the trolls. The friends. Yeah. So the I, ones I always... can be trolls. They can be the trolls, but they also, there's also a grain of truth in some of them, especially if you see consistently, they're talking about the same the same thing over and over again. And they may not say it in the best way, but, oh, well, everyone's saying that the main character is flat in, in so many words, you know, like- Well, maybe I mean, you could you know. could find that in the two, three, four star reviews too. Yeah. Cause yeah. it'd be like, oh, I would've given this a five star. However, it was so predictable, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. so. Yeah, you gotta you got yeah. take it with a grain of salt and know when they're just rolling and when they're- Yeah. You know, sometimes, have you ever watched, and I, this happened to me on Netflix, um, there was a really great foreign movie, like a horror movie, so good until the last scene. The hmm. last scene made the whole ruin the entire movie. And sometimes that happens too. Like you do a great job, and it's just you're not giving them the ending that they wanted. And hashtag and, Game of Thrones. Yeah, that's a great example of that. I mean, the last <laughs> season. I think no, it's gonna get better. It's gonna. There's no way they're no. They're gonna do. Oh, they're gonna come out with some Please. other movie to wrap this up and fix this mistake. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> oh my god! So that's a good example. So so yeah, my point is like to know that know the know the genre, know the tropes expected, um, so that when you start to just you know um, dictate your your story, and you don't have to dictate it. You can you can write it. You know you can type it. You can you can write it by pen. It doesn't really matter. The audience doesn't really care. Um, so that that those are those are uh, cuts a few quick tips on how to speed write. Um, but what I would suggest to write faster is two things. When you're dictating, only write the dialogue and nothing but the dialogue. Huh. Just get through the scene. Don't worry about the the writing and making it sound pretty. Like just get it out because you're trying to figure out whether this story even works. And so, if you could just write only the dialogue, I go as far as when I'm doing the first draft, only writing the climax of the scene. Right. Just the climax of the scene. Yeah. And just the dialogue. Because then it forces you to rethink, like, oh, maybe I don't really need to begin the scene that far. I could actually begin closer to the climax. And you'll get to see whether or not this scene even works without having to go through the entire scene, only to find out you wasted a lot of time. <laughs> but then you're going to get to that first draft or second draft so fast. Mm -hmm. You've got to see, like, oh, actually, this works really great. Or, you know what, though? This character is really flat. And I wouldn't have known that um, if I hadn't actually wrote out the dialogue and wrote the climax of the scene. So so if you just do those things alone, you'll get done with that first draft. Um, I like to give myself um, a break, like a little, little kind of a palate cleanser, create a palate cleanser by working on something else right after that first draft. So that when I look at it again, I'm looking at it with fresh eyes. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, so those are just a few things that you can do. Dictate it. Um, you should write only the dialogue of the scene, and or write only the climax of each scene. And when you look at it with fresh eyes at that point, um, you'll see in a, in a matter of, of of you know minutes right away what the problems are without having to weed through like tens mm -hmm. of thousands of words. Yeah. You'll see really quickly like what the issues are um and even having uh if you want to having somebody give you feedback on just that sort of almost treatment or that novella version of your novel uh, without having to like go through like 
reading all these extra words that aren't because I think that a lot of writers, there's not a lot of control over writing in terms of like sales. So sometimes writers focus on things that don't really matter, like um, whether you you ended your sentence with a preposition, whether I mean all these little gram grammatical things that like no one really cares about, not in today's world. Um, <laughs> they really oh my don't. My gosh. <laughs> <laughs> just, or the two spaces after a sentence. Say it again. The two spaces after a sentence is I a mean, debate. Who cares? Like who well, cares? That was created. You know? That was created for the typing back exactly. when. That's not. It wasn't because yeah. you have to do that. And I was, and I literally posted this on an author group, and the people that were like, "No, oh, it's two. And someone's like, "Why is it two? It's one. And I'm like, "Oh my gosh." My my. Publishing friend from Canada, Claude Laroche, who did Colors of Your Voice with me, he been in the publishing industry, uh, ran a publishing house for years. Double space, it's like, and, and he writes articles for our school. So I'm literally going back in. I know it don't matter, but I'm like ADHD about it. So I'm like, boom, boom, I'm fixing it, everything. So it's always one space. Yeah, it's but like, if you well, put that in something like Grammarly, Grammarly will ask you, do you want two spaces yeah. or one, and can you fix it all? It'll just fix all of it for you. Yep. But I mean, is someone going to give you a one-star review because you don't have two spaces? I think Probably not. Probably some old Karen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's exactly. So, <laughs> like, it doesn't really matter. That, would you rather read a, an amazing story that has one space and maybe even one or two typos or someone who has mm -hmm. everything perfect, but it's the most boring story ever? Like, which one do you prefer? The audience doesn't really care. So I find that sometimes writers... Um, we'll focus on things that don't really matter because there's so mm -hmm. little control over sales. At least they perceive it that way. So they start fixating on these things that don't really affect um, the audience experience or the reader's experience or sales in any way. Um, and um, and it just slows the process down. Yeah. So, I mean, I hire somebody to do that stuff. Let them do that. The copy editors, you know. Um, yeah, editor say, is a must. That's the one thing yeah. you need to pay for. That and layout. Layout and, yes, just there's certain yeah. things you have to pay for. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. I mean, so that's what I would suggest people is like, sometimes um, I'll talk to writers and they're so, they're really trying to make this, it sound pretty and this and that and, you know, and some people are really great stylists. I mean, they're fantastic at prose. And, and so there's a certain storytelling ability that goes along with that. But what you really need to care about is character, story. Does this care? Is this story really moving us? So um, when you when you go through this, say this dialogue draft or this climax only draft, I really focus on. Now I've read all the books, Sid Field, Hero's Journey, Save the Cat, the name it. I've been doing this since I was a kid, right? Um, what what I find what really matters is just a couple of things. Um, when, whether you're writing a screenplay or ready, you're writing a, a, a novel, when someone reads it, they want to know, did this grab my interest? And did it make me want to, and did it keep my interest? Mm -hmm. um, they want to know, can I relate to the character? Um, do I do I root for them to succeed or am I worried about whether or not they're going to? Mm -hmm. If you just do that and that alone, you'll be in the top 1%. Even if every other word is a typo, because um, that's all people really care about. They want to know, like, can I relate to this character? Am I rooting for them to succeed? Um, or am I worried about whether or not they're going to achieve their thing? Um, you could talk about, oh, you know, you have to raise a central question in every scene. I'm not going to talk like that because um, in real life, the, the audiences don't care. They're not, ask, they're not asking those questions that we do as writers. I want to I speak in the language that audiences care about. And they want to know, like, do I root for the characters, you know? So, Carissa, when I text you, do I move you? Because I want to know if it's okay if all those typos are still in. Because I use text to speech to her, and there's like 27 typos in three But sentences. I have learned the the Jamie uh, <laughs> language to know, uh -huh. to, just to sure figure it out. Jeff has context clues. Too. Yeah, there's context clues where I'm like, yeah, that's what he was trying to say. But there have been moments where I'm like, wait a minute, what? Like, yeah, what yeah so then you have to, like, read it. Well, you know what? Don't you hate when you text someone, or even to, you know, whether it be you know speech to text or not, and then everything's perfect, and then it changes the word just if you press send. Yeah. And like, wait, no, I didn't say the f word. Yes. I said <laughs> whatever. You know. Well, and, my and my uh, my auto my autocorrect doesn't cuss yet, so I think okay, it's very okay. very juvenile. <laughs> Usually comes. Well, I did say the f word, and it changes to something else. Yeah, or yeah, it's like your mother. It's correcting you. Like, how dare you cuss in this text message? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. 
So yeah, those are a few few things I would say that are really important. Um, just really focusing on what the audience wants more so than another writer or your 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 you know third grade you know grammar teacher. Like that stuff doesn't really really doesn't, affect. Editing is different because exactly. when I self published the first time, um, I had because I do hair. I had a salon and stuff, and I had two clients that were English teachers. And mm -hmm. I had both of them read and both of them edited different. And I was mm -hmm. like, why, if you're both English teachers, is it different? They're like, well, because one is, you know, in Oxford, one is mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, that's, I don't need that. I don't need that. And so then once I had met Jamie, even though I didn't go with Jamie at first, he did offer me an editor. Mm -hmm. And that was a, that was a really good gift because it did help me understand what I needed to do as far as a book edit versus a grammatic structure edit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. And there's certain different types of editing. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you the, the, the first book that I wrote, uh, Forever My Lady, when I tell you the the typos of it all, I mean, <laughs> when I got the copy edit back after they had acquired the book, whatever, the level of red marks mm -hmm. by the dozens on each page. I'm like, how did they even accept this thing? But they read it, they loved it, and they bought it. So, so they knew they had potential. Yeah, they knew it had a potential. So I'm not saying that you should... I'm not saying, please, I don't want anybody that's like, well, he said he should. No, I'm, I'm just saying that the, the, the focus is on the story. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. you don't take the time to to try to make right. it because you want the audience experience to be great. You don't want to have it filled with typos. But what I am saying is to focus on the story of the characters more so than things that you can hire out um, to for an editor. And, and I just find that sometimes writers will focus on these things that aren't really as important to the audience or to the reader um as they may think that it is so. well and I, I that's another thing I, I i constantly and this is something i have to overcome my personal you know self as an author my very first book wasn't the greatest like structure is i would never write it as i would today today i would write mm -hmm. it completely different i would do it but i had so many people that loved it at the same time but when i someone's like oh what's your book i'm like okay this is my first book just remember, I learned how to write better. Yeah. I need to yeah. stop doing that. I'm but way. yeah, but the thing at the same time, I it's a strange, intrusive pleasure that I have when I read a famous author that I love and they have a typo. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, you're human too. Thank you. <laughs> it's yeah. nice that it gets slipped through. Dan Brown, like I have found uh, uh, things in Dan Brown's books that are. Um, like grammatically wrong. And I'm like, Oh, it feels good to see someone that's so well known and a, a bestseller also has problems with, you mm -hmm. know, miss things slipping through. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, I get emails all the time from major publishers and editors from all the big houses and their emails are filled with typos. Mm -hmm. So like, so it's weird when <laughs> you can attach a grammatic uh, application to most of your emails, any kind of like texting, you can literally have something like Grammarly on everything and say, Hey, this is spelled wrong or hey you probably want to restructure this that's attached to all of my stuff so i don't look as much of an idiot when i'm sending that stuff absolutely <laughs> right exactly so yeah but there are just a few things you know okay mm -hmm. but jeff um you mentioned ingram spark uh the other day and actually they're they're offshoot since ingram bought lightning source and so there are for, you know, self-publishing authors to get their books out there in print. Luckily, we're mm -hmm. with LSI, which was out beforehand. But uh, something I noticed in LSI when we're submitting print, and I noticed this in Kindle now, they have a big new question with the check mark. It says, did you use AI to mm -hmm. write this book? Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on it? Do you, do you use it? Um, is it helpful? Is it harmful? Like what, what think, could you I offer? AI is, is a personal choice. I'm not afraid of AI. I think it's a tool. Um, mm -hmm. And and three years from now, we're not going to even be having this conversation because everyone's going to be using it in some form. Again, mm -hmm. the audience doesn't care how the sausage is made. They just care that it's great sausage. So now whether or not you're very transparent about using AI or not is another personal choice, but I think that people don't like to be lied to. So um, if you say that you wrote it yourself and then you didn't, um, you know, to, to your audience, then I think that's something to really take some thought into. Um, but if you use it to as to assist and to speed things up even more so, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, and and to, truth be told, I deal with all these big uh, authors and writers all the time. 
and everyone's using it. Everyone has experimented with it. When you really get a couple of, uh, you get a couple of beers in them or whatever this is, they, 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 when they start to be honest, like, yeah, yeah, I've dabbled with it a little bit. So everyone is, you know, they're just, they're just they're pretending, you know, publicly, public face, like, oh my God, AI is going to take jobs away. But in, in, in reality, that they are even dabbling it. Now, whether they're dabbling with their current work and what they submit, I don't know. But everyone's at least experimenting with it. Mm -hmm. just, it's a great thing if you use it right. Um, there are some, some, some serious issues we need to face that, you know, could jeopardize um, people's um, way of living and, and whatnot and rights. And those are conversations that need to be had and justified you know, concerns for those. But overall, it's, a, it's just a tool. Um, right. It was funny. Mm -hmm. um, I was watching this clip of the Today Show, and it was right when Photoshop came out. And I believe it was the 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 founder and creator of Photoshop, and um, the journalist. Uh, he was showing a this picture of a silhouette of a of a man on a horse, and 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 he said, "You won't believe this, but this man and this horse aren't even you know weren't really shot together." She's like, <gasps> she said. I, I, but people aren't going to know what to believe anymore. And yeah. now. Haven't we always been that way though? <laughs> well, they has, used to have to manually tape and whatever they used to do before with film. But, um, but that's the way it's going to be with AI. It's just a tool. Uh, now everyone uses some type of Photoshop when they're doing images, whether it be some app or it's actually literally Photoshop. So we will use, it'll just be another tool. It don't get me wrong. It's disrupting everything and doing it fast. Um, and that's what's so shocking because, because people don't really like change, but it is a tool that everyone's going to use in in some form or another. And, um, if they're not already using it, uh, but I think it's also a personal issue. If you, if you're really against your, um, your values, or you really have issues with it and that kind of thing, then no one's forcing you to use AI. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so yeah, you had trained me in AI months and months ago, but uh, and I'm mm -hmm. I'm fine with that because what we had discussed is like Jamie, it's like having a personal assistant and you're bouncing ideas off of. I'm not mm -hmm. saying to AI I want to write a story about dragons and it's writing the story about dragons. I'm literally mm -hmm. bullet pointing and detailing my plotting. And I'm doing my own writing, but I'm like, I may ask it like, hey, you know, I, I wish this was a little more descriptive. Can you give me some ideas? And mm -hmm, then you mm -hmm. can go back and forth with it. And uh, so it's still your story, but it's helping you to embellish it. You know, maybe you want to write a 100 page book and you've only written 70 pages and, you know, I need a little more, uh, you know, scenery in there. So I don't mm -hmm. personally think there's anything wrong with that. I'm still wanting to write the bulk of the story myself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I'm sure sometime in the future sigil four possibly will have some ai and i'll have no problem telling lsi and kindle yes i did you as a you know use ai to help me finish the story so mm -hmm. and really they didn't finish the story i will have written it all myself but i just mm -hmm. want it to be more vivid or more uh in line with how i've written the last three books you know mm -hmm. sometimes you you write a series and then you fall off and uh, like with me you know i haven't finished the series i'm like how did I, how was my writing style, you know, and I, maybe I can't get back into it. So you're like, Hey, follow my old writing style. Boom. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that will become the norm before long. Yeah. There's, there's, there's lots of ways to use it. Um, I wouldn't want it to write the whole story. I actually love <laughs> writing. I actually love <laughs> the storytelling too. process. It's something I, I, I actually a, a lot of fun doing. It's what I, what, what I, why I was put here on earth. So I will never have it write the entire thing. It's great as, as a personal assistant um, to do research. So um, sometimes writers will use research as a procrastination tool. Uh, and so you can ask like, hey, you know, what color is a, is a rose in May or whatever, you know, and it'll quickly tell you so you can stick that in. Um, it can go through and actually do a critique of your writing. So let's say you wrote a, a chapter and like, like, hey, give me some tips on how to make this better. It'll tell you, oh, you know, whatever. It'll give you a list of stuff. You can take it or leave it. Um, you, if you want, if you don't know exactly like how to make a character um, speak a certain language or have a certain dialect, it can make some suggestions or do that for you. Mm -hmm. um, it can look do research on 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 um, popular titles and say like, okay, uh, you know, take this all this PDF, all this data, tell me which titles uh, or which type of genres have the highest demand but lowest competition. Uh, which one should I try? Which which month does best for thrillers or you know, oh. dumping a bunch of data and having it like review the data 
There's so many things you can use it for. Now, normally what would you do? You'd hire an assistant to do all that work manually. It would take them days, if not weeks to do all the work. Right. Um, you know, but for those who don't have the budget to even hire an assistant, they could use AI. So it's, no different, really... it's no different than searching the web. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's it's just a tool. It's just a tool. And that's the thing. We all got over like how you can Google. Everybody uses yeah. Google for the most yeah. part. I mean, majority yeah. of people, and it's, it's just a it's condensed version in the writing realm for good. It's almost like a writing Google. Um, yeah. I feel like. I mean, when people, when, when Google started coming out and people were like, oh, no, go to the library. You need, you're going to take librarians jobs away. <laughs> You've heard of the Dewey decimal system. <laughs> Yeah. You just go, yeah, I mean, like, and now it's it sounds antiquated and ridiculous, but you know, but people used to think that like you're going to take librarians' jobs away, you're going to take researchers' jobs away if you use Google, and now we think that's just the most ridiculous thing in the world. Mm -hmm. If anything, it actually helped them do their job better. And right. so, um, AI is just another tool. You don't have to use it. No one's forcing you to use it if you don't want to use it for whatever reason, um, and and you don't need to justify whether or not you use it or not because it's really none of anybody's business. The problem comes when you're lying about it saying that i didn't use it to your audience mm -hmm. yeah um, when you did that that's the thing people care about but i think the general audience i think the, the typical you know um john smith you know mary sue um in the world they just want a great story mm -hmm. uh, now here's the other thing is that um there there are when you put out a book traditionally published there's a team of people who are helping you make that writing stronger mm -hmm. does that mean the author didn't write it i think not you know, you have a line editor. That's a, editor, you have, That's a really good you know, point. You know, but so instead of hiring, you know, a, a line editor, uh, a substantive uh, editor, a copy editor, a proofreader, uh, a this or that, this and that, um, you know, a co-writer, you are doing all that with just a you know click of a button. Now, is it going to take jobs away? Guess what? Maybe I didn't have the budget to hire a line editor, uh, a, a, you know, a typical editor, a copy editor, a proofreader. Da, 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 da. I'm, not, I'm not taking jobs away because I never those jobs would never have been available anyway. So, but now I can get my writing at the level of a professional without having to um, budget that kind of thing. And I'm sure you know there is going to be people who will be you know picket you know picket and uh, signs like you yeah, shouldn't use AI for this, but let's get real. Um, well, there are so there are, like this is something we've had on previous episodes. Uh, because I'm a college, I'm a college student at Arizona State University currently, and they've embraced mm -hmm. AI. However, you're not allowed to use it when they specifically ask your own words, right. and they have a they have a counter uh, application to know that you wrote it in your own words. Because because of AI, AI has a flip side that when you submit something, it can plug it in there and see how fast you wrote it. it mm, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So like uh, teachers can say, oh, I don't think this, I really don't think the student wrote this because they've not produced anything like this this year. Mm -hmm, they can mm -hmm, go in, mm -hmm. apply the application and it can show the timing of the writing, whether it was a copy paste. Interesting. Or, yeah. So, it, or yeah. you wrote it out or erased. Yeah. It can tell mm -hmm. whether you did that or not now. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And the thing it's is like, it's own you, fail safe. You, you want to, you want to be a writer like you you want to be a storyteller it's not about mm -hmm. at least at least for me like i enjoy the writing process if i can mm -hmm. have somebody help me and i've i've, I've co-written um projects with people i've ghost written for other people mm -hmm. um so so there's different types of writing and you have to look at what you're so what you're really strong at maybe you're a really good storyteller but you're not maybe you have learning differences and you're not really great at sentence structure Right. Um, maybe you're really great at prose, but you're not so great at dialogue. Maybe you're great at dialogue, but not so much prose. Maybe you're good at one genre, but not another. But if you can find a way to be able to do, I have a really good friend of mine. Um, he has dyslexia um, and he's written several books with AI. He just basically dictates. He said, there was no way I'd be able to write this story because I have dyslexia. I haven't been yep. able to, I, I can't write, but I have, he's brilliant. Um, mm -hmm. So AI helps him take what's in his brain and put it on paper um and otherwise do you imagine how many um how many brilliant people out there uh who maybe are not um particularly um educated uh who so many ideas that are going to be able to you know, put those ideas out there in the world because of the help of of ai so if someone's only focusing on the negative that's all they're going to see um uh, but there's yeah. a lot of those those who don't do usually judge what others do yeah so exactly. all the non yeah and that's that's a great point though so a lot of times people have these amazing vivid imaginations of mm -hmm. new worlds and all these things but are not so charismatic with their words so yeah. ai is an amazing tool 
be able to take what's in your head and put on paper, which leads Absolutely. to me. Which leads me to this question. And I, prior to heading to London, I text Jamie as like, I have found, because I was like kind of going through some AI programs. We've we've utilized uh, the chat GPT and just kind of played around with it and experimented with. We did the AI episode on for authors. Mm -hmm. But I've since further like, I'm going to experiment with some that are specific to writers because a lot of times some of the, the AI that's there is not made for fiction writing. It's made mm -hmm. for nonfiction and, you know, uh, corrections and inspiration and, 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 you know, improvement. But mm -hmm. I found one and maybe you've used this one. I, I text Jamie about it where you can literally brain dump. You can build characters. You're doing all the writing. You're mm -hmm. creating um, the the worlds. You're creating this, the characters. You have to fill in all this information to kind. Of, it's almost like a way to organize your book thoughts, and then mm -hmm. you can submit your writing like a chapter sample, and it's mm -hmm. like it'll analyze it and say, okay, this is your writing style. So what it's going to mm -hmm. do is going to keep you on point as you're writing. Like you've kind of missed the mark. You're not keeping the same flow. You've created those mm -hmm. flat characters, and you're not you're not uh, creating a character that you said they were. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's cool. good. Yeah. It's yeah. like almost a writing personal assistant that I found. And I'm like, but I'm writing everything. I've like spent more time writing in this thing, trying to build the stuff. So when mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually writing my chapters and I submit it in there, it's like, okay, you missed this on this point And you said this about this character, mm -hmm. but this is actually what you said. And so it, it, it helps you like you, so you don't miss certain things. It's, but it's not writing yeah. it for you. Right. And the thing is you can, um, you could do both. You can get it ready, develop it, and then hand it off to a human editor to do mm -hmm. the finishing touches, which I encourage people to do. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah. But by the time that they get it, they've, you've done the heavy lifting. So they're not yes. having to spend, you know. Yeah, because it's still nice to have a human who can connect with you to look it over. And that brings me from AI to JI, Jeff Intelligence. Because I know uh, that you offer a lot of these services. I know that you uh, have, there's been big people from Disney or Netflix. I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's those and other companies that send you screenplays or books that you've had to read through and critique to give your thoughts. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. tell me just, I know we got to go in a second, but tell me a little bit about that and uh, let people know how they can get a hold of you because I know you do this on the daily that you're critiquing. So I want to let people know that you do offer this service. Yeah. So um, I've had, since I was 17, I've had professional level writers send me stuff. I had a knack for kind of uh, seeing what, what works and what doesn't work in a story. So I, I've like really big, really huge authors have sold tens of millions of copies of their books have asked me to look at their books. Um, Oscar winners have asked me to look at their scripts and stuff like that early on. Let me tell you uh, that no one's, per, no one's first draft is good. So um, everyone's first draft sucks. <laughs> that's not how much time you put into it. So um, the only difference between it's not some people who are incredibly talented. Don't get me wrong, but the only difference between uh, maybe what you see on the screen or on the on, on in the bookstores and uh, maybe your writing possibly is because of the amount of time they put into or, or the team that they put together to help it make it, it better. Uh, so in terms of to answer your question, um, yeah, I can definitely help anyone basically as a writing coach or a motivation coach. So if it means like helping you uh, put together a team to get your 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 book out there, critique your story. If it means helping you come up with a marketing plan or how to get motivated, get out of bed and just get something on paper, um, you know, or to navigate, you know, going from book to film to how to get actually Hollywood interested in coming to you, which is the best way um, to get people coming to you. Uh, it's a new world. I highly recommend people think about doing things independently or hybrid because this way, like I mentioned, you know, Hollywood will come to you. They've come to me. Um, publishers have come to me um, before I had any of these accolade, accolades and, and I know a lot of people where that's happened. So they're actively looking for people who've got great writing, great storytelling. Uh, so I can kind of navigate and help people and inspire people about that. So yeah, you can reach out to me. My email is jeff at jeffrivera.com. That's jeff at jeffrivera.com if you have any questions. And J-E-F-F, -F, not G E O F F. Exactly. exactly. Not like Jeffrey uh, from what do you, what do you call it? Toys R Us? No. Yep. Oh like, yeah. <laughs> the Jeffrey the giraffe. <laughs> this is actually J E F F. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Jeff, we have truly, truly appreciated you coming on this morning, and 
sharing your your wealth of knowledge, of course. And it's, it's definitely uh, something that I feel like we can expound on more, maybe have you back on. And maybe you could talk about ghost writing, some of the other little even screenplays in general. Maybe mm -hmm. we can isolate some of the stuff you've done in the future and you can give us a little tips for our listeners. Um, so because I allowed Jamie to kind of open up, I'm going to allow Jamie to finish. Don't make me do this. You know how I am. I okay. If you want to learn anything about us, go to alwayswritepodcast.com. We have all these little icons at the bottom where you can listen to us on Apple Music. You can watch us on YouTube. You can follow us on Instagram. And if you need to speak with either Chris or I, if you have a question, if you have a topic you'd like us to cover on the podcast, you can reach out to us at alwayswritepodcast at gmail.com. Did nice. I get it right? Yes. Did I miss anything? All Great right. Job. So I am author Jamie Vendera, and this is. Uh, I'm author Carissa Delay. We are so thankful, and we appreciate you listening. Until next time, always write. <laughs>